In his controversial book, Sunset of Arms, Professor Harold Pusey has implied that during the defence of Hill 329 in Korea in 1950, Major Alastair Fitton, sole survivor of the action, abandoned his wounded and dying men in order to save his own life. Pursuing a libel action against Professor Pusey, Major Fitton has stated that he was forced at gunpoint to leave Hill 329 by Corporal Batley, his radio transmitter operator, who turned on him when the situation seemed hopeless. Batley was supposed subsequently to have been killed in a final enemy assault. But a man has stood up in court and claimed to be Corporal Batley and suggested that Major Fitton has been lying. Testament in your right hand and read aloud the words on this card. I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Hmm. Well, we seem to have established that you are, in fact, Corporal Batley from Hill 329 in Korea. Oh, by the way, do you still use that name? No, my lord. For a number of years now, I've been known as William Truscott. Truscott. Where do you live? And what's your profession? I'll run a little grocery business, Truscott Stores, uh, 42 Hawthorns Avenue, York. Why did you assume a false identity? Well, after the Hill 329 business, I had no identity, not really. I, I was officially dead, as you might say. Well, so I exchanged this with a blown-to-bits body I found further downstream, and then eventually got home. And then I invented Truscott to keep things nice and tidy. And what exactly prompted you to come to this court today? I wanted to see what happened. You wanted to see what happened? Well, I'd read about this book, I mean, and how the Major was suing for libel. And I thought I should see how it all turned out. I was there on Hill 329, my lord. Uh, I could say if it was right or not. Hmm. But surely, by appearing in open court like this, didn't you uh, risk discovery? Twenty years is a long time. But anyway, it's as well I came, isn't it? It's as well I spoke up. What was being said just now is the complete opposite of the truth. Now, Corporal, the complete that opposite, you... my lord. It wasn't me firing revolver at Major Fitton when things went bad at Hill 329. It was him held one at me and fired, fired to kill. Silence, <clears throat> Corporal. Yes. Well, I think we all realize that you'd have your own version of the events. Perhaps if learned counsel will forgive me again, I, uh, but it would save time and complications if I were to simply to ask him to state it. Hmm? I have no objection, my lord. No, I welcome Batley's story, my lord. Very well, now, Corporal Batley. Oh, I think we'll continue to address you in that way. Hmm? Well, it's all true up until when the tanks went. Uh, the Yanks couldn't... And then it's true, too, that I got it on the RT from Big Ray that was going to be an airstrike, but they never said when. And then... Which was pretty nearly 36 hours. Now, the Major was in a bad way already, but the barrage seemed to make him sort of... distrained. Distrained, Corp? Half crazy, my lord, like he didn't know what to do anymore. Oh, perhaps you mean distraught. Oh, thank you, my lord. Yes. Well, he said I was to go through the lines, take a message personally to Brigade, explaining that the situation was hopeless. Through all the gunfire. Well, I didn't understand. I said, why should I do a thing like that when we could use the RT? He said, I had to go, no argument. Was I going to obey an order or wasn't I? Well, he was out of his mind, so I said no. I mean, it was a balmy order, my lord. It was suicide. I wouldn't have lasted two minutes out there. Anyway, that's when the Major pulled the gun on me, said I was to consider myself under arrest, refusing a frontline order. Just at that moment, a big hit on the ridge came and killed everyone except for the Major and me and the wounded further down the hill. He was blown over, and then he jumped up and fired. Fired at me. The shot went wild, but I had enough sense to lie down and play dead. Anyway, the Major vanished and rushed off down the slopes to the river. I got into a foxhole and waited till the barrage was over. For about seven hours, I stayed put, and then I eventually moved out and did everything else like I told you. Yes. Well, gentlemen, I've no doubt you'll both have some questions to put concerning this statement of affairs. Considering its nature, perhaps you'd better begin, Mr. Fry. Yes, of course, my lord. Well, Corporal Batley, I think in the circumstances it's only right to ask you, first of all, why you've waited 20 years before telling this astonishing story. 
for the same reason I swapped discs and got myself a new ID, sir. I wouldn't have been believed, would I? Not against an officer. And I'd refused an order in the front line. Then why speak now? Because somehow I had the feeling the Major wouldn't tell the truth in court today, and I said to myself, if he didn't, then I would. Yes, I see. Now, you've told us that the Major fired at you and vanished, after which you spent the next seven hours in a foxhole. That's right, sir. When you emerged, did you see any signs of the men who'd been wounded previously? The wounded, yes, I saw them plain enough. They were all dead. Now, were there bodies where you'd observed them earlier, or had there perhaps been some attempt to move them? No, they hadn't been moved, not an inch. Those men died just where they lay. So when Major Fitton rushed off down the slope to the river, as you put it, would he have had to pass these wounded men to do so? Yes, he would, sir. Couldn't have avoided it. I see. Now, just one other matter at the moment, uh, Corporal. In general, how were relations between you and Major Fitton? Most times, pretty good. Until Hill, Hill 329, there'd been no sort of trouble of any kind between you? No, none at all. You do realise, don't you, that evidence could be brought to this point? Your superiors in the service at the relevant time would no doubt be willing to speak. I'm not afraid of anything like that, sir. The Major knows the truth. We all do now. Yes. Well, thank you, Corporal. <clears throat> you're enjoying this, aren't you, Corporal Battle? Pardon, sir? No, I say you're enjoying yourself. Bursting into the case like a hero from some old-fashioned melodrama. Attracting all the attention to yourself. You like the limelight, don't you? My only desire is that the truth should come out. The Major's testified to lies. Ah, oh, yes, this devotion of yours to the truth. Now, let's put that to the test, shall we, Corporal? In the first place, you maintain that on Hill 329, Major Fitton drew a revolver on you. That's so. Well, if it happened, was it really so very reprehensible on the part of Major Fitton? What, sir? Well, I say, was it so very reprehensible of him? An officer, under the stress of action, finding his order not being obeyed and drawing a pistol in order to endeavour to enforce it. But look, it was a balmy order, sir. But yours not to reason why, Corporal. That's the army, as I used to know it, and I don't suppose it was any different on Hill 329. Now, you also allege that Major Fitton shot at you. Yes, that's right. Why? Why? Well, if you gave him no provocation, it was surely a most extraordinary thing for an officer to do. I gave him no provocation. I don't know why. There was that big hit on the ridge, I told you, and then he turned and fired at me. Mm, what range, incidentally? 20 yards. 20 yards? And he missed you? No, further. 35. You said 20. And even though you were dealing with such a demonstrably rotten shot, you at once flopped down and played dead. Well, who wouldn't? You've sworn an oath to tell the truth here, Corporal. You're not betraying that oath by any chance, are you? No. Mm. Now, after Major Fitton vanished, as you suggest, you crept into a foxhole. That's right. Where you remained for seven hours. Yes. Showing remarkably little concern for the wounded on the hillside, then. What? Well, your wounded comrades, Corporal Batley. They were out there when the shells were bursting, weren't they? Didn't you recall that at the time? Well, I... I, I mean, was... after all, you did believe that Major Fitton had vanished. Well, I wasn't sure about that just then. He might have been doing something about the wounded. I didn't know. Anyway, I couldn't move. You couldn't move? I was pinned down by mortifier. You've no idea what it was like, sir. But not a single break in seven hours? I mean, well, not a tiny lull in which you could at least peer out and see how the wounded were faring. It just went on and on. Hmm. How did you know when the attack was actually over? The firing stopped eventually. When there hadn't been any firing for half an hour, I reckoned it was safe enough to move out. And, of course, you found yourself quite alone on Hill 329. Oh, yes, sir. But for the dead. No, I didn't mean the dead, Corporal. I meant, didn't you find that the enemy were there as well? Oh, come along, Corporal Batley. The Chinese had conducted a monumental, a pulverising assault. You really mean to now to tell us that they didn't even bother to close up and occupy their hard-won position? I don't know about that. They weren't there when I crawled out. But half an hour after the firing had stopped and still no sign of enemy soldiers, you're lying, aren't you, Corporal Batley? N no. It's Major Fitton who's told the truth here today, the real truth, that it was you who drew a gun on him, forcing him down to the river. That's not so. You who so. might have shot him if an attack hadn't come to knock you out. Look. You, who then realised that you had a serious charge to answer, adopted a new identity and began to live a charade. Now, that's the truth, isn't it? No. It's all lies. Why can't I be believed? If it was the other way about, me an officer, him the enlisted man, it'd be different, wouldn't it? It's always the officers gets believed, always. 
20 years. I just wanted to clear things up if I could. Why did I speak out if I wasn't telling the truth? I stand to lose if this goes against me today. I should be called a coward worse. I didn't have to speak. I just did because I was tired. Tired of lies. still under oath, Major Fitton. And before returning you to my learned friend and the tender mercies of his cross-examination, Major Fitton, the new evidence presented would seem to prompt one or two essential questions on my part. First of all, do you accept as a whole or in any part the story that Corporal Batley has just told the court? Uh, it's amazing. It's quite amazing. Somehow Batley managed to survive Hill 329, that's undeniable. But as for the rest, it's not, well, I think I know. You adhere to previous testimony? Yes, of course. And Corporal Batley insists that until a final incident on Hill 329, his relationship with you was of the best. Would you agree with that? Oh, certainly. I had no complaint of him as a soldier. His ultimate lapse was regrettable from my point of view. You can suggest to us, then, uh, no real reason why Corporal Batley should wish to rise up from the grave and tell these fantastic tales about you? I certainly can't. I was hard on Batley on Hill 329, very hard. I've made no bones about that, but it seems incredible that he... But uh, I, I don't understand. I don't understand. Thank you. <clears throat> well, Major Fitton, we find ourselves in a bit of a pickle, don't we? Ultimately, it seems we have to decide either to believe Batley or to believe you. Well, if that's meant to be a question, I can tell you who to believe without further ado. <laughs> I'm sure. However, if we may revert to the evidence you were giving before Corporal Batley interrupted us, you say you weren't very clear why you crossed the Taidong River. I'm sorry? From north to south, after the final enemy assault, after Batley had allegedly fallen, after you had allegedly checked the wounded and so on and so forth, you say that you weren't clear why you made the crossing. No, no, that's true. Uh, things weren't very clear then, and I'm not very sure what was happening. Well, I suppose not, because it was really rather an odd thing to do, wasn't it? I beg your pardon. Well, Lieutenant Hartstrong has told us that uh, three miles along the north bank of the river, there was a pontoon point known as Brooklyn Bridge. Well, surely you knew that, and knew that if you carried along along the north bank of the river, you would eventually find it and reach help. But one couldn't be sure that those pontoons will still be there, you know. I mean, perhaps I thought I'd strike other enemy emplacements along the north bank. <sighs> you weren't so confused that you couldn't think that, then? No, I didn't say that I thought that. I said I might have done. Hmm. Well, now, this river... How wide was it at the point where you crossed it, do you think? Oh, goodness me, yes. That's 20 years ago. I, I can't remember that. Well, approximately, from here out into the streets. Oh, perhaps. no, no, not, not as far as that. Oh. Perhaps 60 yards. 60 yards? Mm, and how did you cross it? Was it on a raft of the type that uh, Corporal Batley allegedly asked you to construct? Oh, no, no, there hadn't been time for that, had there? No. No, how then? Did you swim? Well, I expect I must have done. Oh, good gracious me, Major. A 60-yard swim through troubled waters in the depths of winter, and you still aren't sure about it. I repeat, I was in a very disorganized state of mind. I made no secret of that. Yet organized enough to check that everybody was dead before you left Hill 329. Organized enough to decide that it was safer to swim across an icy torrent than to risk encountering enemy patrols along the north bank. I repeat, I I'm not sure that I did think like that. Frankly, Major, isn't all this behavior characteristic of a man on the run, fleeing his responsibilities in a fit of blind terror? No. You say that Batley drew a gun on you, and yet Batley, from all this we've heard, was conscientiously carrying out his duties throughout the entire action, whilst you were the one who was nervous, upset, near hysterical. I was not hysterical. I was merely upset because my men were dying. And you weren't. What? You were afraid of dying, weren't you, Major? Mr. Hartstrong remembers that you said, don't let them kill me now, over and over again after he picked you up. I've told you that I had the idea that Batley was still threatening me. I was probably saying, don't let him kill me now. Fighting was still going on on Hill 329 when you were picked up on the south bank. No, no, bombardment only. The action was over. Are you sure of that? Good God, what kind of a soldier do you think I was? I checked and double-checked the wounded to make sure that they were all dead. I even dra dragged Batley's body up amongst them to, to, so I could protect his name afterwards. I can't understand how he's still alive. I checked his heart, his pulse, everything. So you were absolutely clear in your own mind what you were doing before you left Hill 329. You weren't confused at all. How odd, then. 
that having crossed the river, you should have been incoherent, moving without care, so far out of control that you imagined a killer to be on your tail. I put it to you, Major Fitton, that you can suggest no reason why Corporal Battle's evidence, whilst on the one hand directly contradicting everything that you have told us, should on the other fit in much more accurately with what else is known of your state of mind at the time. No, it does not. Now, you're interpreting the facts for your own purposes. Now, there could be money in this for Battle, couldn't there? <laughs> I beg your pardon. Well, it'll make a very good newspaper story. Soldier back from the dead, resurrected Corporal accuses officer. I've no doubt he could try and claim compensation for the army if he could put this whole thing onto me. There's, there's no end to the possibilities. Thank you, Major Fitton. No further questions. It's just one matter we should clear up, Major Fitton. Uh, did you at any stage on Hill 329 give Corporal Batley an order to take a personal message for you to Brigade? No, I did not. That's utterly absurd. Uh, and what then was your reaction when Batley drew this revolver on you and demanded that you conducted him to safety? Well, I was deeply shocked, needless to say. But even then, I think... I could appreciate that I'd had some part in bringing him to that state of mind. You see, I, I've tried to make it clear that I don't altogether blame Batley for what he did. We were under intolerable stress. Batley cracked, and I didn't. It's as simple as that. Thank you. That concludes the case for the plaintiff, my lord. Very well. You may stand down, Major Fiddle. It's for you to address the jury first, Mr. Logan. Members of the jury, it is, as you are aware, the contention of the plaintiff that the statements made about his behaviour on Hill 329 by Professor Pusey in his book Sunset of Arms are false and therefore libelous. The facts speak for themselves. There has been no proof of cowardice on the part of Major Fitton. You may wonder why, in order to prove this libel, I have called only one witness, the plaintiff himself, Major Alastair Fitton. Well, that is because, until the melodramatic intervention of a revived Corporal Batley, there simply was no other witness to call. Only Major Fitton could tell us truly what occurred on Hill 329. And in my submission, there is still only one man who can tell us what happened there. Major Fitton. Major Fitton has been painfully honest with us here today. Long before the advent of Corporal Batley, he was prepared to tell us quite frankly that he disliked his orders, that he sought to be relieved of them, and even that he ultimately left the army because he was faced with no option but to carry them out. Throughout the entire action, his concern was for his men. He wanted the orders rescinded precisely because he realised that his men would die as a result of them. I Absolutely no evidence has been produced by the defence to prove that Major Fitton was at any time in what could be called a cowardly state of mind. And in the same way, absolutely no evidence has been produced to show that all his men, apart from Batley, that is, were not already dead when he left Hill 329. As far as he could possibly know, he was the sole survivor. The Australian patrol picked him up on the south bank of the river in an incoherent state of mind. Uh, it's, it's not important why he crossed the river, or even, strictly speaking, what he said at that particular stage. He was a man at the end of his tether. Logic would almost be suspect. Now, as for Corporal Batley and his outlandish story, 20 years too late, well, I feel confident you will know what to believe there. His motive for speaking is, of course, curious. It, it may be financial. It may be purely neurotic. I don't think anyone who has seen him here today could doubt that Corporal Batley enjoys being in the limelight. In any event, he survived Hill 329. And now, in a new way, he turns on the officer whom he turned on then. He hopes, it appears, to clear himself of that first offence by committing a second, the offence of perjury. Members of the jury, you may not believe this insubordinate soldier, this deserter against a blameless and honourable officer like Major Fitton. I write you, therefore, find the libel proved. May it please your lordship, members of the jury, my learned friend is at least right when he says 
that until the advent of Corporal Batley, he had no other witness to establish the case for the plaintiff than the plaintiff himself, Major Fitton. However, there can now no longer be any doubt that Major Fitton's credibility is in jeopardy. By his own admission, he was very clear in his mind what he was doing before he left Hill 329. Very unclear after he'd crossed the river to the south bank. Moreover, Major Fitton admits that once he was safely out of danger, he falsified the official record. Now, don't forget that. This was a calculated action. Undertaking, he says, because he didn't think that his crossing of the Taidong River could be explained away so easily. And indeed, it couldn't. Still can't. We have waited in vain for a convincing explanation, and only Corporal Battley's evidence supplies it. Now, as to the suggestion that a desire for the limelight and for financial reward were Corporal Battley's motives for giving evidence today, I would remind you that he could have spoken out any time since 1950 with the same meagre hope of reward and with the same certainty of facing charges. For whatever happens here in this court today, Batley is now certain to face a military charge. In other words, by giving evidence here, Batley stands to lose a good deal and to gain nothing at all. I submit that his evidence, together with that of Mr. Lass and Mr. Hartstrong, supports the view that Professor Pusey spoke the truth in his book about Major Fitton, Sunset of Arms. In other words, he has uttered no libel against Major Fitton, and you have no choice but to find accordingly. In this case, Professor Pusey is liable to Major Fitton unless he proves, to the balance of probabilities, that the Major did behave in the manner described in his book, that he abandoned his wounded to their fate. And it comes down to this, really. If you believe Corporal Batley's story, you will find for the defendant. If you believe Major Fitton's story, that he did not abandon his men, then you will find for him, the plaintiff. If you find it difficult to decide precisely what did happen, then you must resolve your doubt in favor of the plaintiff and find for him. Now, members of the jury, you will adjourn to consider your verdict. of the jury, will your foreman please stand? Just answer me this question, yes or no. Have you reached a verdict upon which you are all agreed? Yes. Do you find for the plaintiff or the defendant? For the plaintiff. And that is the verdict of you all? Yes. Well, members of the jury, since you were found for the plaintiff, there remains the question of assessing how much damages he should be paid. This again is a matter for you to decide. And I shall direct you as to how to do it. But uh, as it is now the end of the day, I suggest we adjourn until tomorrow. All stand. Major Alastair Fitton was awarded £30,000 in damages. Next week, a chance for you to join another jury in assessing the facts when our cameras return to watch a leading case in the Crown Court. <laughs>